All good? Sorry. Um, the breathing, can, I, can, I can hear a little bit. Yeah, so... <laughs> It's nice if we want to do like a Darth Vader type of. Uh, How's this? Show. That's perfect. Okay, that's perfect. And and you could signal to me if I'm. Yeah, I will. Of course. He'll Pro. just call it out. Real profession. Yeah. Does it to me all the time. All right. Back by popular demand, it is the post roundtable. I am John Pollock, alongside Wei Ting. And it's a real pleasure to be joined by this man in his hotel room, ESPN's own, Canada's own, Montreal's own, Errol Hawani. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah. How many of these have you guys done? Oh boy, we've. This is probably number four or five. Yeah, I want to say yeah, something like five, maybe four, okay. or five. And who have we done so far? Ardo Cal. Ardo Cal joined us. We did one with Moro Ronaldo. That wow. was really something where we did it in my condo with Frank Shamrock laid out on the couch, just uh, sleeping. Wow. Yeah. So these have, I'm not, I don't want to put pressure on, but we've gotten a lot of positive feedback. Okay. Okay. And these have been, I think, me and Way's favorite shows. So we knew when we bring this one back, it's got to be big. So does it have a name? Like, is there the a The post brand? round table. Okay. And yes. is it only media guys? Uh, it's not restricted to media guys, but that's kind of the the niche we found these shows okay. to be the most entertaining, where our listeners and viewers get to watch, uh, kind of see the behind the scenes process of kind of the media side that I find fascinating, and I'm glad that a lot of listeners do as well, and I know that you do as well. Absolutely, too. yes, I'm glad to be here. And again, as I say every time that we do something together, I'm very happy for your success. Congratulations, you guys are killing it, and I think that you are putting out the blueprint how in 2018. You don't have to be tied to a big entity, a big media outlet. You could do it on your own. That's the beauty of, you know, the era that we're living in. So keep it up. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. I think that, Very nice. you know, your career and our careers, we've gone and completely, we're, we're at the Jerry Park phase yeah, now. Yeah, we, yeah. We've gone back and now you with the worldwide leader. I went corporate. You went indie. We're, we're all trying our. And our for the longest time I was indie, you guys were corporate. Yes. To a degree. Con yeah, kind of. I mean, <laughs> you were with the, you know, the. I guess most things Canadian you can consider somewhat indie on an American level. <laughs> I guess so. But yeah. you're in Toronto, you're working for a corporation, whatnot, and I was working my way up. I remember when John Pollock oh, reached out to me gosh. and emailed me and said, Would you like to be on Moronalo's radio show on Thanksgiving 2007? My website was just a month old. Mm -hmm. I remember telling my wife, I'll never forget it, that I made it that this was the mountaintop. The goal when I started jerrypark.com on October 19, 2007, was to get to the Fight Network. That was the goal, because that was the only outlet that covered MMA, boxing, and pro wrestling. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I loved that idea. And, and then getting to be on Morrow's show, I'll never forget, like hanging up the phone. And, and it's amazing, actually, that I just spoke to Morrow on the show on, yes. on Monday. So it feels like it's all sort of coming together here. And he name dropped you as well. Uh, so yeah. This is great. I'm happy. Man, did you ever foresee the the opportunities being this way for specific to mixed martial arts that there would be a time even even as the UFC was growing that this would be something where there would be so much coverage of mixed martial arts and that you would be able to make a full-time living doing this. Was that always something in mind or was it not realistic? At it time? was the dream. I mean, I put all my eggs in the basket when I left Spike TV in in September of 2007 to start my website jerrypark.com. I told myself I was going to give myself six months to get noticed and hopefully get a job. And and thank God with, you know, three days left. I feel like I've told you this story before. Um, See, I you, got you, the opportunity. You've told us, but I, I would assume a lot of our audience oh, okay. like coming from a wrestling background sure. doesn't really exactly okay, know Okay, so your, I was just skimming history. through it because I didn't yeah, want to Yeah, if you don't do, mind, just very Oh, absolutely, quickly. yes. Um, so, I mean, it all really started for me. I was living in Montreal. I grew up in Montreal. And this is when it really started, like where I really started to realize that this was something I really wanted to do. There was a radio show Friday nights on CFMB 1280 AM in Montreal called In the Ring. And it was pro wrestling only. The host of the show was a guy by the name of Aaron Amadeus. And his co-host was Mark the Shark. And I used to listen to it late at night. It was like on at midnight. It was pro wrestling only. I loved pro wrestling at the time. I was a huge fan. And... They got into a fight on air and then they did like a contest to find his replacement, Mark the Shark's replacement. Mark the Shark quits on air, do a contest. I threw my name in the hat and won. Oh, wow. And so I was I on the, the show. Story. Yes. <laughs> and 
I get there and to me, radio was always my first love. And I, I was just so fascinated by like late night radio, who's working at the studio, just like the whole scene and who's listening to this really, this, you know, this channel that no one listens to generally in Montreal and it's a wrestling show. And so I remember my first day there, uh, they, they dubbed me Ariel the Franchise because the host, Aaron Amadeus, said I was the future. And I just loved everything about it. And it was around the time of the... Uh, was it Ariel the Shark? You didn't no, take I didn't take over that name. No, I liked the franchise and it kind of stuck with me for a little bit. And so it was around like the WCW sale. There were a lot of exciting things going on in pro wrestling. Eventually, I, I moved to Syracuse to go to school at Syracuse University. And so I kind of continued the show, but my own show. And I called it the main event. And it was a pro wrestling MMA show. And so I would reach out to a lot of pro wrestlers and MMA fighters to try to get them on this show. And it was on WERW 1570 in Syracuse. It was a student station. And it was essentially in a, like it was in a closet. No one listened to the station. But the coolest thing about this station was that it streamed online. And this is 2001. Yeah. WERW.SYR.EDU. And can people still find it? I wonder. I, I know it's around and I'm sure they stream, but I don't know if that's the same website, but I looked it up recently and um, it was so cool to get like all you, there were other student stations at Syracuse, but they were very professional. Like there was like a program director, like it was like a real station. This one was literally like sign up, you get two hours and you can do whatever you want. And so I got Saturday morning, seven to 9 a.m. Wow. And there were probably only two people listening. I know for a fact, my mom and my sister. <laughs> and I know that for a fact because we had one phone and I would book a lot of guests as I do now still. And uh, we couldn't make outgoing calls. And so my mom or sister, who at the time my sister was nine, would pretend to be like my producer, call the guest and then call me on conference. That's how I would connect. Wow. Bobby the Brain Heenan. Gave me 90 minutes. I couldn't believe it. Wow. Uh, Dan Severn, Tommy Dreamer, um, Bruce Buffer, Dave Meltzer, which was unbelievable for me at the time because I was a longtime subscriber. And uh, no one listened to these shows. And I, I actually remember this is a funny story. That I was in like uh, psychology classes my second year. So I did it for three years. And there was a girl that always sat next to me and she was gorgeous. And I really liked her, but I never had the guts to talk to her. And one day I met her and we kind of hit it off. And so she gave me her phone number and being the dork that I was, I called her the next day, which is like the number one rule. You do not call the next day, but I called the next day. And it was a Saturday night and she, we were talking about like what we're doing this weekend stuff. And I told her that I was getting ready for my <laughs> pro wrestling radio show <laughs> on Sunday morning. We've all been there. Oh, wow. And guess what? She hit never the gold mine. Oh, back. no. I never heard oh, back. Dude, we've and all I been really there. thought that I was like onto something. I was so excited and... Uh, I regretted that so much. <laughs> I regretted it so much. But yeah, so that's how, so so I did that for three years. Then I graduated and I worked in TV production. I worked for HBO Sports and I worked for a show on ESPN Classic and I eventually made it to Spike TV in September of 2007. And I lasted one week there because we ended up going, there was a there was a show in Vegas. It was Dean Thomas versus Kenny Florian. And at the time, Spike TV was the home of the UFC. And at the time I had sort of resigned um, myself to the fact that I am going to be in TV production. I'm not going to be on camera or on air. And I liked that. I was okay with it. And we went to Vegas and it occurred to me that Spike doesn't actually produce the events. I didn't really realize that. It was all the UFC and mm -hmm. they're just kind of there. And I remember asking my boss, like, what are we supposed to do? Like, what's our job? Oh, we just kind of chill and wait. You know, if they need us, we're there, but we don't really do anything. And I said, no, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Came back on Monday, asked to leave. They got really mad at me. And they said, you know, you're unprofessional. It's the biggest mistake of your life. You're going to regret this forever. And uh, I just really knew that that was the crossroads of my career. This was my chance as an MMA fan at that point, more so than a pro wrestling fan or anything else. This was my chance to go for it because I didn't like the way the sport was covered. And I didn't like the way it was covered from a video and interview perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started my website from my cubicle at Spike. They wouldn't let me leave for a month. They finally let me leave until they found someone to, to replace me. End of October of 2007, I said, okay, six months, I'm going to go all in on this, very similar to what you guys are doing, and um, I'm not going to do anything else. And if by April 1st, 2008, I don't get a job, I will go back to TV production. During that time, I got engaged. It was looking dicey. Was that when we met you? Like, was that when you were running Jerry Park, or was this? Yeah, so happening? John reached out to me one month into Jerry Park right. and asked me to be on Morrow's show. Yeah. My first interview for Jerry Park was Kurt Angle 
after he had just been arrested for a D DUI. And mm. I met Kurt when I was working for Spike and we kind of hit it off. He told me that I reminded him of Brian Gewurz because we both went to Syracuse. And um, I remember doing that interview, first interview, and Meltzer wrote like two pages on it. And I couldn't believe it because that was his first interview as well since the uh, the arrest. And and so like I started to get nervous in March of 2008, no jobs. There were very few paying jobs. And thankfully this website called MMA Rated owned by the Wasserman Media Group called me three days before my deadline and offered me a job. And they said to me, how much do you want to get paid? They asked me. And so I said, all right, how much should I get paid at Spike? I'm going to double it and see what happens. And they said, yes. And then the, their whole thing was like, we're going to be the MySpace of MMA. This is 2008. And I thought it was a very bad idea. And I said, yeah, give me the keys to the car and let me, let me run this. I have an idea and I wanted to do a lot of video interviews and whatnot. And they let me. And mm -hmm. so that, that's kind of how it all started. I think for wow. a, lo a lot of people when they are, tr are frustrated, when they have ideas, sometimes it's just asking and kind of taking that initiative that you can push a lot of stuff through. I think we were very lucky, Way and I at the Fight Network, that we didn't have to go through all these levels of approval. It was simply, if we could just put something out, it's like we were left to our own devices to do whatever we wanted. And that sometimes that, those are the situations that you can selfishly take advantage of and, and not be in a restrictive environment where this guy has to approve of this and you have to go through all these different levels and it's just, it's really creatively stifling. Yeah, and especially in this day and age where I feel like there's, like, like again, what you guys are doing, you guys know what the audience wants more than any suit or any executive and so you should be trusted. And I feel like at this point, I'm not even, like I really don't think I'm a smart person when it comes to finances or being a grown up but I feel like I have an MBA in what MMA fans want. Like, I feel like now I know, if there's one thing I know on this earth, it's what MMA fans want in terms of coverage, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just obviously doing it for so long. Uh, but yeah, it's been, uh, you know, I guess it's been like almost 12 years now. It's been... Seems like crazy. you really had that leeway too, but though when you were working at MMA Fighting, you know, with the amount of, type of content you were putting out. Yeah, so from MMA Rated, yeah. um, that lasted six months. Unfortunately, they sold their entire web division because Wasp Media Group is like this big agency, marketing and sports agency and whatnot. And they sold um, their web division to another company and that company didn't want to be in the MMA business. So they took all the sites. They had a bunch of like X game sites, surfing, skateboarding, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They took all of them except for mine. And uh, so then I was out of a job and that's when I worked on UFC primetime, the first one, BJ Penn versus GSP because uh, I knew the guy who was producing it, Jason Hare, who just produced the Andre the Giant documentary yep. for HBO. That was a very unique experience. It was a very tough job working seven days a week on that thing. Um, I think it was, it was right before that fight you were up here. I think that's the first time I met you. You came up here for your like citizenship or yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that because we went to O'Grady's, the two of us, Yes, uh, yes. one night. And I'm pretty sure that's the first time I met you. Yeah. Like it was beginning of 2009, right before that fight. And didn't we, uh, we did an interview outside, right? No, that was a, no, that was a different time. Yeah. That was, was okay. a separate time. Exactly. Okay, okay. Yes. Um, the most bizarre interview, not because of you, but for the circumstances. Really? Behind. Why? <laughs> so that was a period of time where there were like all these divisions at the Fight Network. And I was told, you do not do any more MMA stuff. And I was like, really? Like, why? And so... He, he, you, was, he was made the pro wrestling guy. Uh, I was like, yeah. that that's what you do. So when you were in town, I was like, this is a great chance to do a, a great interview. So I had to pretty much get way to come shoot this with me. And we couldn't tell anybody. And it was like this big secret. And it was just... How I, did you get it up, though? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I, th I think we just... I mean, I... I, I don't know. I don't really know exactly from your perspective. I'm trying to remember the but, exact uh, specifics. But, I mean, I had, no, by, by that point, you were a name, and I think they were happy to have okay, you know, okay. the interview you on. Okay, You just had to get it done first. Anyway, I'm guessing. I guess so. Yeah. So I, I, I got then hired by Versus.com, which ended up being NBCSports.com, and AOL, FanHouse, mm. and MMA was doing so well for FanHouse that they bought a site called MMAFighting.com, which was owned by a guy in Chicago named Ray Hoy. And uh, they wanted to have their own standalone site. And it ended up being a saving grace for us because shortly thereafter, uh, AOL dissolved their sports site, FanHouse, and, and essentially Ariana Huffington took over. However, they had just bought this MMA site. So for a few months, the only sports presence that AOL had was an MMA site, which was <laughs> bizarre. Eventually, they put the site on the market and it was purchased by SB Nation, 
and then they ended up you know growing into their parent company vox media but i think that if they don't buy mma fighting right before they ended up dissolving and selling to huffington and all that um there's a very good chance like this dream ends back in 2009 hmm. for me which is crazy and so they actually bought so sb nation i remember demetrius johnson versus dominic cruz in washington dc the final ufc on versus show um the heads of so of sb nation slash fox media jim bankoff and kevin lachlan asked to meet with me in dc because they're based in dc at a hotel and they told me that we're but we want to buy mma fighting we want to bring you to sb nation and i was very upset because at the time i didn't really think that highly of sb nation and they told me we're only buying it if you're coming and so i felt like that was uh, like ted turner buying yeah. the wcw with rick well, flair and, and what i did was i was like okay well if you're doing that um i want you to bring this person over this person over this person like you're not changing anything and and they listened and and you know esther and casey who you guys know and some other people they brought over um the majority of them and so that was really great and then that's when the whole mma fighting thing started wow so when when you're starting the the mma hour which is june 2009 yeah I believe I was episode eight or nine. Yeah, in studio, and you were in studio too. No, yeah, I was yeah. separately though. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we yeah. had separate trips to to New York that summer. When when in your mind is the MMA hour hitting its stride? That you're starting to see the traction, and that this is becoming a destination show, not just for viewers but also for fighters when they want to get something out. Is that something years in the making? Like, yeah. When are you getting oh, the yeah. sense of, the, years of that kind making. of following? Uh, I, I remember walking by a studio, a very small studio at AOL, and seeing that there was like microphones like this, a small board, and there were like security cameras. And I was always a big fan of the Howard Stern show. And I loved the fact that it was a radio show, but you could also watch it on TV. And so I said, can I do an MMA show? And we'll also put it online not live that wasn't really a thing but then we'll put the video on online and they said yeah okay after some convincing they gave me 15 minutes that's what the show was going to be 15 minutes and uh i was like i have 15 minutes that's like that's my intro at least give me an hour so the first three episodes the show was called fight house radio and then they found out that there was some gym i think in new york city called fight house so we changed it to the mma hour and i would say for well, so what? So that's 2009, right? Yeah. 2011, SB Nation buys it, right? And that was a mess. I was actually just reminiscing about that last week when John Jones was in studio because uh, SB Nation just didn't really understand what the show was at the time, and so they put me in what I called like the WWF Livewire studio. They put me in like a control room with all these TVs in back of me for one episode, and it was a total disaster. It just so happened that John Jones was my in-studio guest for that show. It was horrible streaming issues and whatnot so we we went on hiatus in the midst of that hiatus so like now the show has completely lost any momentum um in my opinion because you go away uh that's when new york rick reaches out to me and says he wants to work on the show and i sent his email to someone who was working at sb nation at the time and said hey maybe this guy can help he seems to be an mma fan we're starting something new uh, they had to build a new studio and that's when i had like that tiny little space where mm -hmm. like the first conor mcgregor appearance or the mayhem miller episode rampage dancing was in that little booth and so that happened and so now we're talking 2011 2012 and it felt to me like 2013 2014 like few connor appearances he blows up that's starting to become a thing around then 14 15 that's when it starts to be a consistent thing and for me the big thing was never miss an episode you got to be there every week and so i remember when i signed contract a three-year deal with SB Nation in 2015 to stay for three more years I was very proud of the fact that I never missed an episode except for when my kids were born um and and sometimes I was supposed to take two weeks off and I came back I just felt like I needed to be on every single Monday and so that stretch from 2015 to 2018 of essentially doing the show every week I think is when the show started to find its groove that's a philosophy I know John has always lived by with with all of our stuff uh, have, you know, what, what, can you talk a little bit about maybe like what you've had to kind of, how that's affected your personal life <laughs> having this schedule? So I love doing the show and I'm so proud of it. Mm -hmm. And I call it the show, even though I'm not at the same place, it still feels like the exact same show because it really is in many respects. Um, and we can obviously get into that if you want, but I book the show and 
I am sort of obsessive over the fact that every show has to be better than the last one. And so like, I never even give my chance, myself a chance to appreciate or enjoy or smell the roses. Like Monday, as I leave the studio, I'm thinking, how do I top this? Who am I going to reach out to? What are the big stories? Who are the biggest names? Like I always try to hit a grand slam every time, not even a homer. Like I try to go for the biggest name, even though I know there's a very good chance that these people aren't going to come on. Sometimes you'll, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get it done. Um, and so, yeah, it puts a lot of stress because I'm the one booking it. It's not like a show where it's like, okay, who's on this week? You know, you get the list and uh, all right, let's do it. it. It's on me. And then the easiest part is actually doing the show, which, you know, has ended up being three, four, five hours, whatever. Um, booking, I put a lot of pressure on myself. And especially again in that stretch of 2015, 2018, where I felt like, okay, the show's taking the next step. Um, I really want to establish it as the show in MMA. Like I, I, I don't, I hate when people call it a podcast because I don't view it as a podcast. I feel like the, my goal is to make it the show of record where, as you said, like you want to break news, you come to my show. You want to, you want to be in studio, you want to be seen, you want to be heard. I want you to come to my show. And, um, and so like, yeah, I put a lot of pressure on myself and there've definitely been times like Thursday, Friday, I start to get very anxious about the show. Like, what am I going to do? Is it going to be good? How am I going to top it? Um, and uh, I'm a very anxious person. And so I put, it's, it's by far the, the most gratifying, but also the toughest part of my job. Um, more, is, so, more so than like your interviews that you do at the UFC. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's not even, not even a question. Really? That's my baby. That's my pride and joy. Like mm -hmm. I, I feel like I really built it from nothing. And um, you know, I, I, I feel I have a very personal connection and that's why it was very hard for me to leave. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of unknowns and, um, and that's why like, I'll, I, you know, when, when, I feel like my partner in crime and all of this was, was, was New York Rick. And when mm -hmm. he, you know, when he said that he wanted to leave as well with no guarantees of anything happening afterwards, it's just like, I came here with him. I'm going to leave with him. I mean, to me is like the nicest thing anyone has ever done yeah. for me. You know what I mean? Like the nicest gesture, I guess, cause he didn't really do it for me. Mm -hmm. Um, he has a family too and whatnot. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a fun, it's been a fun experience doing that show. I don't know how long I could do it for because it's like, I feel like it's killing me, but it's fun for now. That's what I was trying to get at. How yeah. long can you keep this pace know, where you're man. trying to, you know, outdo yourself for every single I don't episode? know. I, I really need to to figure that out because I feel like it like, I, I really like pour a lot into it. Um, I get very nervous. I, I feel for you too. It's to me, it's like, I, I can say the, the hardest thing that I do and I'm hardly the leader in my field at this is when it comes to, uh, breaking any kind of news and, and doing that element of things that I find to be the most headache inducing because it is, it's always the, as much uh, sourcing as you can do, there's always a certain trust you're putting in, in sure. people for information. And to me, it's like, it's nonstop. It can happen at any hour of the day. And, and you're at the forefront of that on top of this, this show that you are putting out every Monday. Yeah, so that's a very interesting thing as well because there's a lot of pressure that comes with that too, right? Um, and as you mentioned, like every time I, I, I break a story, even till this day, there's like an element of like, holy moly, holy moly, like what am I getting myself into? Is this right? Do I believe this person? And now you start to realize like who's telling you the truth and who's not and yeah. who wouldn't burn you because you have relationships. But earlier on, you weren't quite sure, right? Yeah. One of the interesting things about my my new job is that they're not as reliant on me to break the news. It just so happens that you know, my colleague, Brad Okamoto, has a very good relationship with the UFC. So at MMA Fighting, I was the one who had, you know, all the connections, may not have had the best relationship with the UFC, but it was sort of part of my job. Like, we all had roles. I will view that era, especially the last three years at MMA Fighting, like, I, I feel like we were the Golden State Warriors of, of MMA media. And what was so great about it wasn't that, like, we were the best at X, Y, and Z. We just all really knew our roles very well. Like, no one, mm -hmm. I felt was stepping on each other's toes. No one was envious. Everyone was kind of working in unison. We were all complimenting each other. That was a team. It was a great team. And I really enjoyed being a part of that team. And I really like, I, I, I felt proud that we were kind of the little train that could. You know, the investment that Vox Media made in MMA as an independent outlet, I think is like one of the more underreported things. Like Vox Media isn't ESPN. They're not Fox Sports. And like they sent us everywhere, right? Um, and I feel like we repaid them um, by by doing the work that we did. But you know, to have a full time photographer and a videographer like Esther and Casey, and like to have columnists and to you know to have the whole gamut um, was a really big investment. And I was really really proud of that. And I and I 
you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't foresee myself leaving or anything like that. There was only one job that I would have ever left for. And it's, you know, the, the opportunity that I have now. Um, and, and even when I left, there was a part of me going back to your point. I was like, okay, maybe this is the end of me doing this like Monday thing where I book the shows. And then everyone was like, how could you leave? I was like, man, I can't, I can't end this now. I feel like that would be a mistake. So that's why I continued. But I thought it was the end. Uh, I do want to talk about that move, but just uh, one final thing on on the show and booking the guests. Are you finding now that there's like a a frequent, you know, it's them coming to you now? Yeah, yeah. Is that something? That's kind of when you, re- like, I don't remember when that really started being a thing, but that's kind of, you know, the signal, I guess, that you've, you've become a thing, right? When people mm-hmm. are pitching you and you're even having to turn down, right? I mean, there was a time where I was like begging anyone to come on um, and, and certainly like the quality of the guests um, has has expanded and um, you know even when I came to ESPN they're like uh, you know it's like, why does it have to be so long you know can it be two hours one hour and I don't I don't know if I could physically do it because there's just so many guys that I want to talk to and females as well and people are pitching me and I'm and I'm reaching out to them so yeah you start to notice that happening you're like okay people actually care about this and it means something to them and what a great compliment or someone there have been a few times like for example Jack swagger aka jake hager like he mm-hmm. flew in specifically to do my show mm-hmm. i didn't pay for it he did it himself um and break the news that he was coming to mixed martial arts uh aj agazarm who recently signed with beltor yeah i reach out to him hey do you want to come on he's like if you give me the okay i'm booking a ticket right now from la to new york it's saturday night so mm-hmm. i have to leave tomorrow i'll be in studio to make this and i want to do it that way and i'm like really it. I mean, I really do feel like it's at the point now where like they 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 see it as a sign that they've made it to be on your show. So it's MMA's Tonight Show, like not to yeah. like you the, know you. pump your your ego, but it's for for fighters that I mean, it's it's really amazing if you are going back to that that first Conor interview that must be brought up so much to you. Like you listen to that interview, the story of Conor McGregor is outlined in the history of your show. Yeah, it's wild. It's 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 true. I mean, you can go back to every like. Um, and thank you for that, like the, the, the Connor who was on welfare and then after the win. And, you know, I remember talking to him before the, the, the Holloway fight and he, that, then he showed up late. So the first time I talked to him was before the, the, um, the Marcus Brimage fight when no one really knew who he was in America. And then right after the Brimage fight, and then we took a little break and then he's about to fight in Boston, right? And originally against Andy Ogle and then Max Holloway, and he was late, and he was wearing, and he shows up wearing sunglasses and backwards hat and all that. And I said to him like, "Oh, look at this guy! He's big time now. You know, he's oozing confidence. He's such a superstar." And uh, and he said something like, "Did you not get that impression from me the first time?" And I was like, "Yeah, I kind of did." But it was just like now, you know, he's sort of graduated to a different level. So yeah, no, it's it's been amazing. And Connor, you know, he's you know, say what you will about him. He, he, he came on the show this this year, you know, when, when um, he was about to fight Habib. It really means a lot to me that he, he sort of hasn't forgotten um, and that he, you know, the appearances are a little bit, you know, a little bit spaced out, but still that he would come back means a lot. Seeing like, you know, like working kind of around you backstage at a lot of the UFC events, I've always kind of been impressed at like how, how you're able to establish a rapport with so many fighters so that, you know, even outside of, you know, what you do for them on a, on a PR level or an interview level, um, they feel comfortable around you. Like, do you have any kind of a, maybe a thoughts on, you know, or, or any insight or any advice on how you do that? Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge part of it, right? Because if you don't have their respect, um, then you have nothing, right? If they don't trust you, you have nothing. And so I always tell fighters, you know, I reach out to fighters a lot. Part of the job that there's no direct, dividends that comes out of it is the constant talking checking in texting calling where you don't even ask for anything Mm -hmm. you know what i mean and i feel like to a degree there's there's a science there and there's an art to that to where it's like you just have to be a human being Mm -hmm. and you have to understand relationships if i keep reaching out to you fighter x every time only to come on my show and do an interview and essentially do i view it as you're doing me a favor by coming on it may have ended up where it's like we're both you know, benefiting from this, but initially you were doing like, no one was listening. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're doing me a favor. And, um, if I'm just always asking, 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 you're going to get annoyed. You know, if I'm always asking for your time, you're going to get annoyed. So Mm -hmm. there's a a lot of times where I'm just like, we're just talking and then, all right, cool. 
good to talk to you. I'm done. I don't want, you know, uh, I told the story recently where, um, you know, I hadn't talked to Connor in a while and I found out that he was in New York and I found out what hotel and I waited for five hours in the lobby very recently, like in July, uh, actually New York Rick came with me and, um, he finally came down at like 1130 and we talked a little bit and he's like, so like, what do you want? I was like, well, I just wanted to say hi. That's it. I don't want anything. Oh. I didn't ask you, I don't, I don't want an interview. I don't want anything. And I feel like, you know, some, this is a relationship business as well. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when I'm in the business of like booking the show myself, it's coming, the texts are coming from me. The requests are coming from me. I think it's very important. So you have to be professional. You have to be respectful, but you also have to remember like they're not robots, mm -hmm. you know, they're not animals. You have to be a normal human being towards them. And the most important thing is them trusting you like that. They know they're coming on your show they're in good hands. Now, you'll ask them questions, maybe it'll be uncomfortable, but you're not gonna burn them. You're not gonna embarrass them. You know, it's always gonna be fair. Um, and that's something I pride myself on. And if you tell me something on text and you tell me it's off the record, it will always, forever, from now until I die, will be off the record. That mm -hmm. takes like, what does that really mean? That's just like a code off the record. I could run and print that thing in a second, but there has to be a trust there. So for people to tell me things, and, and believe that it's not gonna get out, to me is like almost a, a huge sign of respect and, and, and like a validation that, okay, our relationship is now at a different level. I think that a lot of people listening, like off the record is such a foreign concept to some people that it's not something that is just dictated by one side. It's, it's an agreement. Like yeah. you are essentially, yes, I agree. This is off the record if you're that reporter. Have you ever been put in a situation where you, you've, like this information I've been given and then it's ended with, all that's off the record that mm. it's pushed you that oh, yeah. is this big enough that I'm willing to risk this relationship because what I've been told here, I can't just bury away. Never. If, if it's off the record, it's off the record because there's always going to be another story. I mean, there's tons of stories. We could do a whole show on stories that I've waited, waited, waited um, because I was told it in confidence and for whatever reason it either wasn't done or, you know, this game is a lot different than the NBA and the NFL. You know, there's a lot of fear um, there's, there's, and it, and it's, it's weakened a little bit, but like, you know, managers are afraid of the UFC and the matchmakers. I mean, the matchmakers and, 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 and the UFC and, and the promoters, like they, they say, if this gets out, we're pulling this fight. I mean, so I don't blame them for being afraid and I don't blame them for not wanting to tell me like, what do they get out of that? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's reached a point where, you know, the managers recognize the relationship and, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a sharing of information type of thing because I'll share information too. If I know it, you know, a lot of managers will call me like, what are you hearing about this? Is the fight done? Is, is he in? Is he out? I'll do that. I have no problem with that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, it's just like, it's again, it's just like part of the relationship and whatnot. But if you tell me it's off the record, I can't. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you there. It's fine. I was just listening to uh Jeff Merrick and Elliot Friedman's podcast. And I always love when Elliot will go into like the nuts and bolts of his reporting and stuff. Cause I just always, I'm learning from it too. 31 reasons. 31 thoughts. Thoughts. Yes. Darn it. And Elliot's talking about, um, you know, he, he puts out for those unfamiliar, he puts out a blog called 31 thoughts as well every Thursday. And it's just 31 gigantic talking points, interviews, news. It's like a, it's like a mini observer for our wrestling fans out there. And he's telling this story about a hockey player that's brought in by his general manager. And he pulls up Elliot's blog and says, three weeks ago, you were quoted in his blog. Three weeks later, an unnamed source was quoted. Are you the player that was the unnamed source? And it's like, that's the love. And that's when I realized, like, I always assume like there's an added paranoia in MMA and pro wrestling because there's a dominant leader that nobody wants to rock that boat and future. But that it, it exists everywhere. Yeah. Like that, that level of, of paranoia of, Am I going to get burned by this media person? And I think that it's it's going to take you years to be able to establish that trust that what you tell me will, if you're telling me it on background, it's not going to be linked to you. And if it's off the record, it's off the record. But I think that there's just a natural paranoia of uh, you being linked to something like that. And you know, it's it's not really my favorite part of the job. Like my favorite part of the job are, are the interviews, no yeah. doubt. Like if you told me seven days a week, you can do interviews and you don't have to do anything else, oof. What a gift from God. Like, I don't necessarily enjoy it. It's a rush, but, you know, the, the scoops come and go and people don't credit. Like, who cares, really? You know what I mean? And at It's the never day, been like, a fun part for me. Mr. X is fighting Mr. Y. Okay, great. You know, we'll find out in the, you know, like, does it really matter in the grand scheme of things? But to me, like, sit, like getting to sit down with Chris Weidman this week and him opening up and John Jones, like, that's what I live for. I love that. The other stuff is kind of a means to the end. 
Where would you say like your kind of code of ethics as a journalist comes from? You know, I know you went to school for it, yeah. but I mean, there are a lot of people who get into this now these days who don't get proper training for it and just kind of go ahead and maybe see what you do and then just go ahead and try to bother, you know, X fighter for uh, scoop and, and whatnot. But I, I kind of, I'm kind of curious where you kind of get your, it comes from Syracuse university. Yeah. The first class that I ever took at Syracuse was journalism ethics. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really understand what that was. I don't even know if I knew what the word ethics meant really. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole class on the things you should and should not do. And I'm, I'm certain that there is someone watching this right now who will say, well, weren't you paid by the UFC? You broke your rule. Like that's the number one rule. You can't be paid by the entity that you cover. And it is the biggest regret of my life. And it is something that I will never live down. Uh, I was just, I was put in an un impossible situation. It's either you want to be on TV, you got to take this job. You don't want to be on TV, you want to remain the internet guy, you don't take that job. And, um, you know, we again, we could do a whole hour thing on my relationship with Fox and how I feel like they, they kind of set me up for failure. Um, well, we got stories about working for a company that we, we had to cover as well. Exactly, yeah. yeah th that's just the game, and especially in 2018. I, I thought my particular situation was very avoidable. And they just didn't want to budge, I think, because they didn't really like think too highly of me for whatever reason. But um, I really prided myself up until that point, like little things like you don't take presents, you don't take any like all that stuff really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I will I will never do that ever again. I don't care if it means, uh, you know, not being on TV, being on. I don't, I don't care. I'm never doing that because, you know, I, I, I said I remember saying this to my boss at, at Fox the first year that I was there. I was like, I can't look at myself in the mirror. I can't. This is a, this means a lot to me, you know. Like this is something I said I would never do, and they said, you know, it's our money. We're the ones paying the UFC, and it's just part of the deal that they control productions, and so so it's coming from us. I was like, yeah, yeah but like so then why don't you just write me the check if it's coming from you? Yeah. Oh, it's the deal, blah 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 blah. So it's this whole thing I had to sort of come to terms with in my own mind. But yes, the 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 classes that I took at Syracuse is really I think which you know kind of shaped me into. I am today. The way like media landscapes are these days, I mean, ultimately we're only going to be dealing with one or two or three companies that yeah. control everything, and right? Constant conflict. I mean, yeah. uh, I'm I'm a Blue Jays fan, right? And and mm -hmm. there are great journalists who work for Rogers. Yeah. Um, and then there's Bell, right? And and they have their conflicts as well. I mean, that's just in this in this country alone. So working for ESPN, how do you, how are you trying to avoid that? You know? Okay. Well, uh, first off, I haven't really felt it. Because yet, because the deal hasn't started yet, uh, I would be lying if I didn't say I am, you know, cautiously optimistic and awaiting. I could tell you from even before I started, um, the differences between ESPN and Fox to me were just glaring um, in that they believe a lot more in journalism and in backing their guy. Like the stuff that happened to me at Fox would never happen at ESPN. It hasn't happened but I know it would be dealt with differently. And that makes me feel very good and comfortable. Um, when I signed with ESPN, I had no idea that the UFC was coming. Mm. Absolutely none. Yeah. And I would be lying if I said that after signing and finding out that the UFC was coming, that I didn't have major reservations, that I was afraid that I had made a big mistake, that um, it was gonna be you know the Fox experience all over again. Thus far, it has been nothing like that and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that that will remain the same. UFC is doing a lot of their own production. I will never do something that is being controlled by the UFC or get paid by the UFC. Like I'm out, you know, I'll, I'll do my own thing. That's cool. Uh, I don't, you know, it's funny. I, I saw Dana do an interview when the news came out and uh, I think it was on uh, the UFC filtered podcast and uh, he, uh, <laughs> He, uh, he's like, oh, he's not going to be anywhere near our shows and whatnot. And I was like, good, I'm happy. I don't want to be anywhere near them. You know, I'm, I'm thrilled that I work for the company that owns the right. It's great. And the investment that they put in MMA is incredible. Like if you guys could hear the way the people at ESPN are talking about MMA, I keep saying like the sport is in good hands. The sport is in good hands, man. They are so excited mm -hmm. that the UFC and MMA is coming to that network. It's crazy. They're so into it. Combat sports. They are so into like boxing is doing phenomenally well as well. So it's amazing. What an exciting time. But yeah, I don't want to be on like UFC programming that's run by the UFC. No, thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's something like like way alluded to that we were kind of thrust in this position where I mean, I from a, a business standpoint, it was just 
like the fight network was shifting. They were going from a news outlet to owning content and that was fine. But we kind of got caught in the middle. It's like, here we are doing this one job. And it just, to me, I was able, like I hold myself to a really high standard that I knew I was not going to be compromised in this role, but it's like, you're getting it from both ends. I would get, why are these people being so negative about impact wrestling? They should essentially, they should be shills. They're all under the same umbrella. And then you got the other people who are just looking at you as no matter what you say, you're, you be, it's just, you're getting the perception. And that drove me insane. Oh yeah. I sympathize with it. Fox. Now this thing that happened with Greg Hardy, it's like already started. People are writing to me like, what are you doing about it? What are you saying about it? I was like one of the first people that said that it was incredibly tone deaf and a dubious move at best. And I think you, it, you can't win that. I cannot like, win. Like, and it's just, it's, I, I learned that right away. And it was just like my, my final couple of months there. It was just like, I was just so relieved by the end of it all because it was just, it feels like a weight is lifted off your shoulders. But one thing I have learned, and I had really thin skin when I, when I started this and, um, Man, you know, like when you read about yourself on on the internet, you know, the first time you like see like hate about yourself and people critiquing you and calling you things, man, you, that is an experience that is is not really common and is not really normal. Um, and that's why, I, you know, I always talk about Gina, why I love Gina so much. It's not because of, you know, how she looks or anything. She actually made me realize that like, hey, I did an interview with her on the day that uh, I read this oh, I did this interview with Forrest Griffin and it was so awkward, the interview. Like, I just didn't know what to do with myself in the interview and he kept making it awkward. He was like holding me and like- Forrest yeah. Griffin? Yeah. Oh, are you surprised? Right. <laughs> I, I've, oh, been, I I've been there. I know, yes, exactly. Like, this yeah. is like peak Forrest Griffin, right? Yeah. And I remember reading on MMAmania.com, like all this hate about me. And then I went to a press conference in Times Square, a lead XC press conference, the Kimbo Slice James Thompson interview, and I was so down and I just didn't want to do it anymore. I was like, this is not worth it. I don't want people critiquing me. Maybe I'll just go back to like audio interviews. And then I had like this exchange with Gina. I was like, you know what? And of course I've, I've, I've fallen down the trap, you know, many times, but you have to just stop caring. And I, I've really, I, I've really made a conscious effort to like not read YouTube comments and things like that. I love the feedback. Like if someone sends me an email or sends me, you know, a nice tweet or things like that, it's great. And even if it's, you know, a negative one that you can learn from, but um, you can get consumed because the thing that I always say is like the same phone that I'll call my mom on today is the same phone that I'll read like your negative take on me. And that can mess with your mind. Like mm-hmm. it's a Sunday afternoon, you're with your kids. I didn't invite you into my world. Why are you, why are you taking advantage of, of this, this, this mm-hmm. relationship that we have and, and this medium? And, and so like that's something you have to come to terms. I'm still coming to terms, but I feel like I've gotten a lot better. Yeah, yeah, I think... Uh, I think we've all been there that you just kind of, it, it comes with the territory and it really I just makes you down. I, I go sometimes days without even checking my mentions and it's just, it's, it's cleansing. But I see it as coming, you know, w- with success. You, if th- nobody out there, no matter, I think how, how great your work is, even the best person in any field, I'm sure receives like, like Michael Jordan, I'm sure receives a ton of criticism. Absolutely. I mean, can you imagine being LeBron James, you know, mm-hmm. like constantly? So yes, Absolutely. But it takes a while to come to terms with that because you didn't necessarily sign up for that, right? Especially, I think, I would say, you know, people like yourselves where I think you guys in, in many ways are perfectionists when it comes to your work. So any, any, you know, myself included, if I hear something, somebody comment something about, you know, maybe like t- this morning we had uh, issues uploading a podcast and I woke up to that and it just, it still bothers me that it's not completely fixed right now. But I think that just comes with the territory. But, you know, like you've said, maybe the, the key is to not let it, bother your personal life especially yeah and much easier said than done but if you didn't care then you guys wouldn't be as successful as you are right Right. because if you just half-ass it or you take a week off or you put out you know like nothing bothers me more and i I know you guys feel the same like people take advantage of podcasts in the sense that like oh i'll just you know throw up this audio like no it has to sound like you're in a radio booth at least for me as a listener if if you told me that there's an interview with someone that i'm dying to hear from and, and it sounds like crap i can't listen to it it'll just drive me nuts and so like that, that, that pride and that, you know, that, that feeling of oh, this has to be perfect, I think comes across to the listener or viewer as well. So I, I think once you lose that, it's probably best to move on. Um, just uh, talking about the move, uh, when does, you know, you mentioned your contract's coming due 2018. Yeah. Is this something that, that's building up for a while? And what ultimately is that decision-making process like? Is this a pretty lengthy decision to, to make for yourself like was this something 
that it took one specific instance or something that you just arrived at this conclusion that it was time to move? So when you were asking that question, I was thinking to myself, like, what do I say, right? And I will tell you the truth. And, and I respect if you don't yeah, no, want no, no, no. to delve too deep. So the beginning of the end, in my mind, was Mayweather McGregor. And um, I've never told this story. So this is exclusive. Uh, the beginning of the end was Mayweather McGregor. And what happened was... Um, Remember when I went to, I, I, I waited at the Gentleman's Club owned by Floyd Mayweather. We did the interview with yep. him. Uh, Casey and I, uh, my videographer at the time, waited for six hours for him. And um, it was incredible. What an experience, right? Like the Thursday before this mammoth fight, we're talking to Floyd Mayweather in his club. Nothing is shown in the background or anything like that. We were upstairs. It was just an unbelievable experience. And uh, we do the interview at 4 a.m., and I have to host like an on the road episode of the MMA beat um, at 10 a.m. So we get in the cab, go back to our hotel and we upload the interview. And I remember taking a shower and I remember going to bed and going to bed for an hour, waking up and doing the show. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, you know, eight, nine a.m. In, um, in, in, in New York, like on the East Coast. And the, the, the interview is like starting to pick up steam, right? And it's like, wow, Floyd Mayweather and a gentleman's club, all this stuff and more. And I remember sitting um, on the set of the MMA beat and uh, a friend of mine, John Beard, texts me and he's like, how come I can't watch your interview? And it's like 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern, oh, Pacific time. I was like, what? So I go on, on the site and I see that the interview is private. And uh, I was like, what the heck is going on? Well, I come to find out that... Um, Someone high up, I don't, I don't want to say names, but someone high up uh, thought that the content was questionable and decided to take down the interview oh. and didn't okay. run this by me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very upset. And uh, by What was the questionable content? That it was in a strip club? Yeah, Floyd Mayweather in a strip club talking about, you know, like there was nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we should talk about this. We should, uh, and like, you know, to our earlier conversation, I kind of was my own boss in a sense that like, I feel like I have pretty good judgment as to what's good and, and I've never yeah. burned the company before yeah. and it was taken down and I, and I felt like that was incredibly disrespectful to not even reach out, to not find out about the process that we went through to get that, to not mm -hmm. appreciate that we got that, to just take it down from whatever office that you're in, to me was a slap in the face. You were spitting in my face. And I, I told the producer that I was with, I said, if this doesn't go up, I'm leaving, I'm done. I will never work for this company again because for everything that I feel like I've done, all the amount of time, effort, um, and, and, and the interviews and everything, for someone who doesn't even work with me on a day-to-day -day basis, who isn't a part of the MMA fighting team, to go in and take that down without talking to me or any of us was just incredibly disrespectful. So it ended up being this whole ordeal. In the end, I won. Because what I said, this, this got all the way up to the CEO of the company. What I said to him was the next day we had a conference call on the Friday of Mayweather McGregor after doing like live shows on the road, all this stuff, booking all the guests. I said, we could have had this conversation as to whether or not this was appropriate beforehand. And we could have all weighed in and had our own guesses as to how the public would perceive this interview. But the beauty of this situation was the interview was live. And we know how they perceived it. It was met with incredible enthusiasm and like, wow, I can't believe you scored this. There was no negative comments. No. Just, so I'm right. I know, actually know how the, the, the verdict plays out. I'm right. Mm -hmm. So this is not even up for debate. This should be up. And it killed the momentum of the interview and all this stuff and more. Um, and, I, and so I was, I was in my mind, I was like, wow, like things have changed here. This is like a little bit of a shift in regime. Things have changed. And so that stuck with me. But I wasn't like, it got resolved and I kind of like moved, the, our coverage I thought was very good and I was very proud of it. So I sort of moved on. However, you know, September, October, November, nothing's really happening and my contract's up in June. And, uh, you know, I'm not like, no one's talking to me. Like I have three kids, you know, I want to know what's going on. Right. I'm an anxious person. Mm -hmm. And like I said, there was only one place that I would ever leave for. And <clears throat> around November, uh, I got the opportunity to go to ESPN to meet with a lot of people there and talk to them and go to the campus for the first time, which is an unbelievable experience. And so that was in November. February, three months later, is when I got 
an offer from ESPN. And between February and April, either myself, and I won't get into the weeds because it's too boring at this point, but either myself or my agent reached out to the brass between February and April, mm. at least once a week, if not multiple times, because there were multiple times. Hey, we have an offer. Can we talk? Can we get something? Do you want to do a 10% raise, a, a 10% cut, 50%? Like, give me something. Like, I, I'm not asking for a con. I just want to know where we're at, you know, like what we're thinking here, you know? And uh, till this day, of course, I've moved on, but I never got an offer. Hmm. Wow. And uh, that hurt me as well. And um, it just got to the point, a few, th a lot of things happened and got to the point where I just decided like, you know what, uh, this this opportunity is too good to pass up. Why am I waiting? You know, I don't know what's going on, but uh, it's time for me to go. And, you know, initially I, I kind of had like weird feelings about it all. And, uh, you know, I felt like, okay, I'm sort of the captain of the ship. And, uh, you know, is this a mistake? Am I abandoning my team and things like that? But you know, I, I, I made a point to call every single person and tell them personally before it got out because I really, truly love and admire the people there. Um, I, I, I consider them friends to this day. And it maybe was a little awkward towards the end. And I hope that feeling has gone away. But I really didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. You know, I, I, I told them and I still mean this, like I root for them and I want the site to succeed and thrive and to go on. Um, but uh, it, I was a little bummed after everything that happened that like I couldn't even get that. Um, and you know, things happen. And, and, and so it ended up that, you know, I ended up agreeing to the, and like, I was, part of me was thrilled and part of me was sad as well. And that's why on the last episode of the show, I was very emotional as I tend to be at times because I was dealing with that conflict of emotions, right? Like I'm about to live my dream and get the dream job, but I'm also leaving my friends. And I love being a part of that team, the little train that could, and, and being a part of what we became. So it was a very tough thing. Like, and, and June 14th, was my last day at MMA fighting. And my first day was June 15th. You know how crazy June 15th was like to wake up and now I drive to Bristol and it's like all new people and you kind of have to prove, it. it's like the first day of school all over again. Mm -hmm. And so like, it has been a strange year, like an exhausting year, an emotional year for me. And uh, I'm really happy with the way things have turned out. Like I, I'm, I'm very happy now, you know, initially when you start a job, there are growing pains, you're trying to figure things out, but man, the people in particular, and it's funny we're talking today because I, I, I posted a picture of them a couple of days ago on my Instagram. Like there's a group of people there that um, I'll, I'll just say their names very quickly. Glenn and, and Nick and Elisa and uh, Brittany and Jake in particular, like they, they just like welcomed me with like from day one, welcomed me with open arms. I felt so much love from them while I was still worried and afraid and wondering if I had done the right move or not. Like they really just welcomed me. And so now as we approach January, um, I'm very happy and excited about where things are. But yeah, it was very difficult. It was, I mean, nine years I was there. You no, know, I, so. I don't doubt it. It's it's a lot of the times it's not so much the role or the company, but it's it's the people. Like that's that's one thing about you know we, me and Way leaving friends that we worked with for yeah. 12, 13 years that you're just not around anymore, and it's you are part of that that team aspect and yeah you're like you feel like your 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 teammates but you're also family and like you've been through so much together ups and downs by banning all that stuff and now you know i'm i'm gone and um i i recognize that i was sort of like viewed as the face of the site but like that's that's a well-oiled machine with mm -hmm. or without me mm -hmm. um and i like being a part of that machine like i like being a part of that team the word team like i know it's sort of like a cliche and things like that but i i just love that like i love being a part of like a group you know mm -hmm. i i love playing basketball like I, I was always a i was always a team sports guy not like i, I never did like martial arts as a kid because i love being a part of a team i like being the captain of the team and i love like going to war with each other and um that was that was the hardest thing like the camaraderie that was the hardest thing to walk away from yeah, and I've, I've seen how competitive you are at basketball. Oh yeah, we played basketball. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you guys mentioned this basketball thing. Like, I was was I really out of control? Or no, something? no, no, oh, no. Okay, no, because no. I am crazy, you, but I don't feel in that particular game. I like was I, I was surprised that I, I guess I I. I I saw you take it as seriously as you did because I thought it was just like a uh, like a good you know oh, yeah. like like exhibition. That was like <laughs> me at ten percent. Yeah, I'm insane. Yeah. Who who was who is comprising? Because we were facing like uh, Canadians versus Ben Americans. Folks. Yeah. Uh, 
Ch- uh, Chuck was on Team USA. Brett, Brett Okamoto was. Yeah. Okamoto, yeah. And by the way, this was on the Toronto Raptors practice court. And yes. Rudy Gay, yeah. who at the time was on the Raptors, very popular player, was working out. And Masai Ujiri was there too. It was crazy. I like, as an NBA fan, I love the NBA, maybe even more so than any other sport. Like, this was surreal for me to be there. That was one of the best experiences. That was UFC 165. Jones right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just uh, the final thing on the ESPN thing, a question I've always had. Did Michelle Beadle scoop uh, scoop you and the announcement? <laughs> no uh, comment. No comment. On okay. That one. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything uh, way you want to finish up with? Because I mean, this has been excellent here. No, I, I mean, I, I appreciate you sharing, especially. Yeah, you know, I've always, I, you know, and I, I will be honest, I've held back a little bit in 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 that story, so I, I feel like I'm not giving you the entire story, but that's really the crux of it. Like, I just felt with Mayweather McGregor, I felt like that was the beginning of the end Mm -hmm. and I felt like it was a sign. And if I ignore that sign, then I'm making a really big mistake. And thank God, you know, I didn't talk to anyone else. Like I didn't go to Bleacher Report and see, like I didn't play that game at all. It was just one place. I I always wanted to go to ESPN. I always Mm -hmm. wanted to live that dream. And um, thank God that, you know, it's not Fox again because the Fox situation like made me into a better person and a better professional, but it was just very disappointing how it ended up. Um, And I hope that, you know, there's no hard feelings with the people at enemy fighting. I mean, I, I know mm-hmm. that like with the, the 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 guys that I worked with and, and and Esther, like like there's no hard feelings there. I know that, and I believe them when they tell me that. I don't know about the the top dogs, but you know you got to do what's best for yourself. And I feel like they kind of, I mean, they never made me an offer. So what am I supposed to do? It doesn't sound to me like there was any, like I would have done the same thing, and right. most people would have probably done the same thing in your position. Yeah, I mean you know? this. Like, there are always going to be complications. And I'm sure when you went through the whole banning thing, like, it seemed like they really had your back Absolutely. at that time. So it's, I mean, you know, there's time. I think everyone, there, there's times you, you're frustrated. And there's other times that things are great. And it's a relationship. It's, there's many extremes to it. And, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I will admit it feels still very weird that my baby is growing up without me. And that's the show. Uh, I helped design that studio, that name. I booked every guest in the history of the show. It it, it feels very weird. I'm I'm not going to. He's lie. talking about the MMA hour, yes. everybody, not his actual. Uh, yes, 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 yes. But I I kind of viewed it like you know I had that thing before I had children, and mm-hmm. uh, so that's very weird. And like to go up against it and stuff like that. Like there's no denying that's an awkward thing, and uh, you know I wish they handled that differently. I never asked for the show. I just thought it was. I I just thought like, okay, I'm the show, and like you're gonna do something else. I wish they handled it differently. I wish they talked about it with me. Trust um, me, media companies are very protective of their intellectual, intellectual property. property. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know what's funny about that, and like here I am just like laying all the cards. You remember there was one episode Joe Rogan did a, a an MMA like he now does like an MMA show. Yep. And he called it the JRE MMA Hour for one episode, the first episode. Oh, okay. And everyone like. Mm-hmm. went nuts i didn't say a thing i kind of thought it was a little funny like of all the names and everyone on twitter was like that's ariel's name that's ariel's name and so when he did that and it it blew up into a thing and this is november of last year this is not that long ago it's like this is like i'm talking like 13 uh yep. yeah 13 months ago that's when they trademarked the name wow the show had only been in existence for eight years wow. for it had been in existence for eight years and that's when they trademarked the name so i just want to thank joe for <laughs> forcing them to oh. trademark the name because had he not done that but like like we were saying earlier like the, and we've kind of noticed this ourselves like this that's just a name like they don't have era Hawani, you know they don't have you know it like, still feels weird i'm, sh- I'm sure we talked does. about this i think off air like you know if the law went on without you I have no doubt that you would feel a little funny about it um, because you pour so much into sure. this thing and it's like, it becomes a part of your identity. And there's like moments, like I remember when I had my kids and I'm like, there's just, your, your life is attached to it. Mm-hmm. And uh, to see it continue and I don't know, it just, if it, it felt weird initially, people who really like did nothing for the show are now talking about it. Like, no, 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 like that, that's my, that's, that's my thing. Yeah, I created that. Like. And you know, if 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 it was me, I wish it was just handled a little differently. Uh, last thing on my end is you know, kind of just a, a general broad question right now on MMA media for it, just in terms of positions that are out there, the overall health of things. I know you've been very instrumental with the MMA JA. Uh, where do you think it is right now that there's 
you know, we've seen ebbs and flows with, with the popularity of the sport and where we're at now, kind of going into this new era with ESPN. But how do you assess like the that just the health of MMA media, maybe even compared to two or three years ago? Is it I is it thriving? That, is it struggling? Is it? I think it's very unhealthy. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually very sad about the state of MMA media, not the talent. I think the lack of opportunities. Yeah, that's the problem. Um, and a lot of talented people out. that just can't get work. Yeah, that bums me out. Um, like, I am sad about what happened to Sure Dog, that it's no longer a player. And, you know, MMA Weekly isn't as big as it once was and things of that nature. And Fox Sports doesn't really cover MMA and probably won't once, um, you know, they let all those guys go. You know, I remember when the Fox deal started, everyone thought like, this is going to be the place, right? Like, that's the, the gold job to get, right? Um, and so essentially, I think about this all the time. And I, I feel like maybe people will be surprised if they hear me say this. I get nervous all the time. Like, okay, what if I lost my job tomorrow? Where am I going? There's only yeah. essentially three places that are paying you to cover MMA these days, right? ESPN, MMA Fighting slash Fox Media, and MMA Junkie. Am I missing one? Like Yahoo has one guy, Kevin Ioli, and, and he's been there forever and he does a fine job. Um, it does a great job. And, but like, where are the other sites? Fox doesn't do it. USA Today is like, there's just nothing. So Fightful's trying to do some uh, stuff with, with like wrestling, boxing, MMA. Oh, and by the way, I'm not trying to put anyone. No, 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 I'm not. I'm just like, it's, it's scarce. I'm not denying it. By the way, I'm not, I want to be very clear because I don't want to offend anyone. Like there are, there are definitely sites out there that are hustling and doing their thing. Fightful is one of them. Um, there's, um, uh, flow combat. Um, there's MMA today, uh, you know, BJ Penn, Mac life, like they said, but like, I'm talking about like, oh, there's a big entity behind me and they're going to consistently pay me and there's going to be no problems and stuff like that. I mean, or maybe I'm thinking about someone like my level at my level, like of experience, where would I go? And so there's just not that many opportunities right now. When you think back a few years ago, when, you know, you were talking about that, that media game, like you look back at like the outlets that were represented in, in that game, you know, I remember mm-hmm. like SI used to travel to events and there was a time USA Today was an entity and MMA Junkie was an entity, um, ESPN, Fox Sports. Uh, there just were, you know, um, to me, there were just a lot more opportunities, you know, AOL, we were AOL uh, and now uh, there's just a lot less. So uh, it kind of scares me and I hope that there aren't any young journalists who are a little bit like deterred from entering this because I, I think we could still use a lot of good young journalists Mm -hmm. and I hope that they recognize that, look, it's okay to start your own thing. You know, you don't have to strive to want to work for MMA fighting, try to beat MMA fighting, try to be, you know, the, the and keep keep costs realistic. Like, yeah, yeah, it's great to be able to travel if you've got a budget, but if you don't, you're not so handicapped that, I mean, compare this to 2009, even that you can do this. Uh, I look at someone like a James Lynch. Like, look what that guy's done. Hustles, yeah. and and it's not because he's he's you know flying to every event. It's just using what's at your disposal. That's myself and Way are you know we don't have a giant budget attached to it. It's a fairly simple setup that we're able to do, and we're not traveling all over the place. We don't have an office. We are just d- doing what's realistic, and that's probably what's go- going to. For those that want to make it, that's, I think, something that these outlets have to keep costs in mind as well of what's what, what we can afford. To, you also have to look at the landscape and say, okay, there's this, there's that, there's this. How do I carve out my own niche? Yeah. I yeah. think you guys have done a great job of that as well. Like, mm-hmm. you give people what they want and you give them something different. Don't try to, like, I, I, I sometimes young people would write, will write to me and say, like, I want to be a journalist and this is my work. And I see their work and it's all just, like, fight night recaps. Mm-hmm. Well, how are you going to you know, how are you, how are you going to make a name for yourself? You know, I, I will regret saying this the moment I say it, but a perfect example of this is fellow Canadian, Mike Bond. Mike Bond recognized Absolutely. that, oh, stats, info, these little factoids, I could cover them. I'm sure that's not what he wants to do forever. And he does maybe a little less of that now, but like initially that's how I first found out about him, right? Because he was offering something different, right? Um, and like Esther, Casey, they offer something different. Uh, and, and so like to me, the people that stick out are the ones that offer something different. And so like that would be the best advice that I could give to anyone. Like, Get a gimmick. It doesn't, yes, but it's a steal a pro wrestling phrase, but like just be different. Don't try to be myself or you guys, like figure out. There's there's plenty of 
different ways that you can attack this, especially in this day and age with, you know, the amount of different, you know, forms of media that we have. Well, this is a wonderful segue to end this way. We kind of, uh, I guess, have kind of set ourselves a little apart by doing our reviews. Uh, yes. So I want to put you on the spot okay. for just a really quick review. Okay. Uh, I thought you were going to ask me for my viewers uh, and listeners. Oh, oh of, wow. This is Can you please something. let us know this children's book and what they can expect if they wow, pick this up. Wow, this warms my heart. I don't think heart. we even wow. know. I don't even know about this. You don't know about this? I have no idea. He kept a secret from you? Uh, I, I was not told about it. That's why he's a pro. Okay. See, you wa See, this is why when it's a pay-per-view, you guys don't watch together. You don't speak <laughs> to each other because you want the, the natural. Re that's, a great little, yeah. that's a great little thing that you guys do. I don't know how you do it in the same house. So what do you do? You go to the house. Way gets the basement. I get the upper level. And whose house is this? Mine. Your house. Yes. And you do not talk. Not during the show. No. no. Not even. Not even like a. I'll say hi when I like go get water upstairs. But like, can, you, can you imagine? Okay, that uh, John Jones when he's in studio. Imagine he came a half hour early, and you guys are in the green room together. By the time you get on, it's like how much have it's going to be. I couldn't agree more. Tougher. Couldn't agree more. When I did that, um, I pay per view thing with Connor in Manchester when we did that interview, they asked me like, "You want to come see him?" And I said, "No, it's like a wedding." You only want to see him when like the lights are on. So I did not go talk to him before. Like so I, I it's agree. funny. That relationship ended in a divorce. Not with you and Connor, but yes, you yes, and yes, I, I guess yes. the... Yes, that's the right. Outlets. That's right. Yes, never got paid. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but no, no, I appreciate it. But here's my question. Like, why don't you talk about other things? Like, just not about... Like, why don't you talk about like, oh, how was your weekend? This, that. I mean, when the show's going on, it's not like we're just sitting... Like, I'm taking notes. Oh, okay. I'm running There's the website. So okay, it's right, like, right. it's There's not... No time. Yeah. Right. And... That stuff is stuff that we kind of save for for these podcasts. Too. Okay, fair enough. All right. I love it. I, it that's yeah. dedication. So this is yeah. Mirth Meets Earth, and it's about this space puppy that travels the world and learns about different cultures. And as you see at the bottom right over there, it says, illustrated by Jacqueline Stein, yes. who is my wife. Yes. So wow. she illustrated this book. It was written by Michelle Glasser, who is um, a friend of ours. And she, she did all the illustrations about Mirth traveling through the world and uh, you may see here, it's a very cool thing. So that's my wife right over there and our daughter, Claire. Oh, and I was a little bit mad at her for not including all three kids in the picture. I was like, why <laughs> yeah, did you where's just the, choose Where's young one? Oliver? Yeah, I mean, really. Um, but you know what's funny about this? You see, like, Michelle, she put both her kids. Like, what do you, like, be proud. You got three kids. What's going on? <laughs> she just probably took the first picture on her phone. I know her. But it's amazing because we just actually got a dog. And I've never been a dog person before. And now we have a dog named Macha in our lives, who is my uh, brother's dog. And he kind of basically like he just couldn't take care of her anymore. He's okay. He just, I don't know. He's single and whatnot. So and he so, gave him to the guy with one of the busiest jobs. in. Uh, yeah. And three kids, <laughs> six, four and two. And yeah. uh, it's been an, a really eye opening experience because I never was a dog person. And uh, she's sort of like stolen our hearts, as you would expect. So uh, maybe the next book is going to be. Is, is is matcha the same type of dog as similar 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 it's a it's a, a, a burn a doodle um and a, a very cute dog and, and uh it's just amazing to see like the kids interaction so it's funny that we actually got this like this book came out almost at the exact same time as that dog so um i appreciate i know i know but john bought this off amazon wow this sent me a text cool. right yeah absolutely and, and you you've read it i have read it what do you think I liked it a lot. I like anything that, that Max, uh, my son, yeah. uh, just did, doesn't cry did, out and just sits back and enjoys. You felt like he, he was captivated by it? I, I, I don't want to speak for him. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. And I, is I he two know. now? No, he's uh, 17 months. 17. So we're so he, I mean, one and a half. He's at the point where he will like... He's starting to really acknowledge things yeah. now. And uh, you should ask him in, in a couple of years. What okay. Do, what do you think? Of this? That's the review I want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's started now... He says "dada" all the time, and at first, I, I like it's it's heartwarming. But now I'm starting to realize he calls everything "dada." That's so it's just like it's <laughs> like he'll point to stuff. I'm like, I don't know if he's really acknowledging me. It's just he has learned this word that he applies to everything. No, it's 100 percent you. He has a connection to you, and when he's pointing to it and saying it, that means he wants you to give it to him. Wow, that's really connecting the dots. Yes, so yes, that's the best in the business. He's he's thinking like that as the, the my entry to all this greatness in this world. Well, so I well done to you. I will keep that in mind. Ariel, we've keeping you uh, long enough. Thank you so much. No it's always great to sit down uh, and you being as open as possible. I think people are really going to enjoy this. And we always appreciate your, uh, your support and friendship. Absolutely. Keep up the great work, guys. 